Welcome to the RF Elements Unlicensed Podcast. I'm Caleb. We've got Tassos over here. What's up? And this week, we are super excited to be having as a guest Dwayne Zimmerman from Crow's Nest Broadband. Say hi, Dwayne. Hey, how's everyone doing today? Woo! So, uh, we're super excited to talk about him, his experiences uh, as a WISP, and everything that he's been doing. And uh, ready to roll here in a second. So before we hop in, toss us. You want to give the good people out there their call to action? Absolutely. Don't forget to like, listen, and subscribe to our channel right here on YouTube or anywhere you download your audio podcast like Apple, Spotify, and Google. All right. All right. Dwayne, we really appreciate you taking the time to uh, talk to us, man. You know, we, we've known you for a while. You've definitely known in the the spaces that we hang out in you know publicly and stuff and i think this is a great opportunity for you to you know talk about what you're doing out there what you see going on in the wisp industry isp industry as a whole and i don't know share your history share your experiences and things like that so we really appreciate you being here man yeah thanks good good to be here i know you guys have been uh been uh after me for a little while to be on here and you know it's <laughs> part of this space is always being too busy um but other part of the, of it is, from my point of view, is I feel like there's so many people in the space that have been here so much longer than than us. You know, it's sometimes hard for me to uh, remember that we've only been in the space since 2019. So, um, lots of people with a lot more experience than us, and it's like, man, what can I tell people that they don't already know or that they haven't already heard? But um, now it sounds like uh, just. And watching these shows over the years is a great place to have fun. Uh, occasionally rant about a few things, but... Um, no, <laughs> no we, we, don't, we don't rant. Uh-uh. No. Nah, not us. Not at all. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm looking forward to it. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm a numbers guy. Um, I got this whole yellow legal pad here of numbers. Uh, it's end of the uh, beginning of the month, so you're on the end of the month numbers, and uh, something our team always looks forward to, and... Yeah, I've got some <laughs> some interesting ones here that uh, if it's fit to get into, we we might do that at some point here today. Yeah, for sure, for sure. So, you know, and I think one of the values of the inter- uh, interviewing all these operators is you think, well, you know, what can I teach people? But I mean, you know, everyone's network is different. Everyone's experience is different. Skill sets, issues, um, challenges they overcome and stuff like that. And you know, a network where you're running could be completely different from a network that runs, you know, out in the flats in Texas or Alaska or anywhere like that, right? So everyone definitely brings a unique perspective, I think, and we're excited to hear yours. So I guess, you know, before we get too deep into the, the nitty gritty details, uh, give us a little bit of a history lesson. Like, how did uh, you decide this is how you wanted to spend your life like 24-7 and <laughs> join the madness, right? Because it really is... It really is my life. I mean, you're always on call. You never get away. Um, you know, so so you hit the nail right on the head. Yeah, so my background is um, is telecom IT. I started in the space about 14 years ago. Um, my then boss sat in this very office that I'm in right now. It was my uncle. I was working landscaping. I didn't know anything tech at all. I didn't know Q&W or besides on the keyboard. I didn't take any technical stuff in school um he reached out to me in the winter months said hey why don't you come on board i'll I'll teach you how to do phone systems at that point in time they were doing big phone systems in school districts um figured i'd try it during the winter didn't have anything else to do three months later I, i was like i'm not going back to landscaping i love this tech thing 11 months later i was promoted to take uh the senior tech's position he left and went to CenturyLink. And um, fast forward a number of years, basically we got cross-trained into all things IT as well as telecom. Uh, we did a lot of uh, corporate wireless systems, so I was trained in RF as well. Um, so that really, uh, I came into this with a, with a good understanding of RF, not in the ISP space, but in the commercial Wi-Fi space, warehouses. Um, I understood Wi-Fi well. Um, my uncle sold his company to a um investment firm i guess we'll call it i couldn't stand that we were very uh small business common sense first name basis type company before and now all of a sudden it was all about bottom line and numbers and nobody cared about anything 
I left, went through a non-compete. When the non-compete was up, started my own business doing IT in the small business space. Um, anything from phone systems to camera systems to POS and everything in between. Predominantly in a very rural setting. And I'd go out, say you had the hardware store. You put a new point of sale system in for them, put a camera system in. They spend $30,000. A week later, they pick up the phone. Hey, Dwayne, this new system you put in, it sucks. It's slow. It's like, well, no, it's not slow. You're running on 3 meg DSL, and I, I can't do anything about that. And so that was where that seed first got dropped into, into my mind was, hey, how can I help my business customers do better than this? And then it's like, man, I know RF. It can't be that hard. I knew ubiquity from working in the IT space. We did point-to-point -point bridges between buildings, and so I was familiar with then the M series, um, this was, you know, Air Max was maybe in the very, very early stages at that point. Um, started doing some, some inquiry. I went to, um, took the ubiquity training certs, the UB, whatever you call them, UBWA or whatever, the wireless admin and the network admin or whatever. Took a couple of those, started doing some research. Um, I, I still didn't really know how to go about it. Um, our corporate office at the time was in Altoona, a city of about 50,000 people. And there's an antenna farm on top of the mountain there that has no fiber optic, about 30 towers up there. I went online, had a yard sign made, dropped the yard sign out there by those towers, and was like, high-speed internet, call this number. Surely somebody needs internet. Mm. And uh, uh, was it a week later, my phone rings, and it was somebody said, hey, I saw your yard sign, we own a tower up here. We're TV station. We're going from standard definition. We're backhauling it all the way from Pittsburgh. You know, it, it's 480. We need to go high def. We need 50 megs of bandwidth, um, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And I said, that's great. I need a tower. What can we do? And uh, they said, hey, we've got a nice new tower here. You can have all the space you want on it rent free if you get us internet. And so I was like, yes, uh, there, there, there's step one. Next step was finding a place down in the city where I could get a fiber circuit. Um, <laughs> I had lots and lots of experience, thankfully. One of the things that we did in the IT MSP space was we brokered um, internet for our business customers. So we took everything. You, you, you give us a copy of your internet and phone bills. We'll review it. We'll find the best provider for the best price. So I knew how to negotiate, caught up all my salespeople with the cable companies and the phone companies. And today I want a gig of DIA. I guess that's how you start out. What can you do? Ended up signing an $800 a month contract on a three-story flat roof building that could see the tower. Um, the owner of that building let us on rent-free because he wanted internet as well. So we started with basically an $800 a month out-of-pocket commit to something we didn't know the first thing about. And uh, it, that was, uh, I think, August 2019 that we hooked up our first customer. Um, it's October 2019, I guess, would have been Wispapalooza. Um, went to the trade show there. Didn't know. Never heard of RFE. Never heard of pretty much every name in the space. <laughs> uh, it was just a matter of going there, getting to, getting to uh, meet people. And I don't know if you guys remember the 600 megahertz repack that happened mm -hmm. um, when T-Mobile bought 600 megahertz spectrum. Uh, the TV antenna ta that was co-located on the tower we were on repacked that weekend when we were in, uh, in, in Vegas. And they went to a frequency just above FM. And it got into all of my cat cables and all my radios started rebooting. They started going to <laughs> Uh, my tower went down and I'm a thousand miles away and, you know, it's like my first tower. And I remember going to Wist Talk, posting about it. I didn't have any idea what this was. And the good people on there were like, RF chokes, you need RF chokes. And I, I overnighted them from Amazon, I think it was. My climber went out the next day, climbed it, put RF chokes on and it fixed the problem. And it was like, man, this is just the greatest community ever um you know within five minutes somebody had told me what was wrong you know what was going on and uh it was all down here from hell from there we've never looked back i mean it's been it's been a bad journey that's crazy um <laughs> like what a wild ride to get started right so yeah um yeah. so and uh, you're still on that tower now 
still still am i think the top three top four you know of our of our 60 plus towers now so we're still on that tower um still still great tower it's one of the we actually just deployed uh toronto on that tower it's it's a brutal tower we've got 14 horns on it there's a it's one of two towers where we co-locate with another wisp there on the tower next to us they've got a dozen horns brutal environments an antenna farm there's 15 or 20 towers up there countless people doing five gig backhauls um but we're still there i mean needless to say we started out with uh three by 30 ubiquity hd sectors and at wispafalooza 2019 and everybody said you've got to go with rfe and it's like i never <laughs> even heard of these guys I, i'm sure i shook you guys hands there at the show i don't specifically remember talking to you but i remember seeing the product going back and and just running that budget again it's like man how many of these can i afford to go from sectors to horns we decided we couldn't afford any at the time kept our sectors but within four months probably we took them down and put horns up and we've never looked back we couldn't be on that tower today with 12 14 horns if it wasn't for actually for the most part we're doing 30 degree asymmetrical horns that are flipped to 20 degrees and we've just got them stacked in there Mm-hmm. Yeah, they work really well. So still there, still one of our favorite towers. What frequency are you running with the Tehran? Is it CBRS or is it five gig as well? Five gig. We're running it smack that- on top of the the rockets, and neither one of them seemed to be phased by it. That was why we tested awesome. it there. We wanted to put it in our most brutal environment and put it through the paces. So right on. So what? So are you still running primarily for your five gig stuff? Uh, ubiquity, like. Air Max AC, have you done any LTU stuff or what do you what are you mainly doing there in the distribution side? We are we we have a mixture. We are predominantly ubiquity as far as our five gig radios go. Um we do a mix on pretty much every tower of Air Max. At this point, for the last two years, every config has been almost the same. We do three hundred and sixty degrees of coverage with Air Max, the the Rocket Prism five AC Gen two, um, generally on sixty degree asymmetrical horns six of them if there's higher density we'll go to 30 degree horns and tuck a few more in and then we overlay that coverage with ltu any place wow. that we've got density under five miles so if we've got a population center five miles or closer we'll put 30 degree horns up we'll put ltu up and we'll and we'll have both um and we've come to really really like that config we have our 59 sta from the FCC, which we've had ever since COVID, we keep renewing that every 90 days. So we've got 45 megahertz of extra spectrum there. Um, the LTU for us, it, you know, if I had a list of things that have been game changing for us, it would be L- LTU would definitely make that list for the simple reason of the 59 STA, but in but tucking them in a 20 or 30 degree horn, overlaying them with, you know, in our density areas um we've been you know we've got rf elements horns with ltu that have got 60 customers on and they they don't even blink i mean they just they just keep going and uh it's been a game change for us to do that you know rocket prisms they start to fall down around 20 well, we run a really clean network i mean we've got 800 some five star reviews on social media um, we run the best network that we can possibly run. So we don't overload our radius. So as soon as we've got 20 customers, 25 customers on a rocket prism, we're either cutting that from a 60 degree to 30 degree and adding another rocket in there, or we're coming back and we're doubling up with LTU, shortening up those connections, making them clean, uh, moving everything close to the tower to LTU. And to do a 50 meg channel with, which we've mostly done on LTU, We've been able to sell 150, 200 meg plans um, and just rock away with it. So other five gig stuff that we're using, we, you know, we spent 40 grand to, to put some Toronto out. We're testing <laughs> Toronto <laughs> in our most <laughs> harsh environments. We just officially went live with that about a month ago after about six months of testing. Um, we've also got about a dozen or so of the Radwin Neo duos out. How are they doing? You know, I, I, Honestly, so it was 4th of July, 2021, 4th of July, 2021, or maybe it was 2020. No, it was, I think it was, I forget now. 
2020 or 2021, 4th of July, it was the day it was, we got the very first Radwin Neo Duo in the United States. They direct shipped it from Israel to us. We were working with them at the time. Um, they came out on the 4th of July weekend, set it up in our lab. And it was like that same week, we got our 5.9 STA and we got 2.1.0 firmware for LTU with the STA from Ubiquity. 2.1.0 fixed all the bugs that we had with LTE. We got 45 megahertz of free spectrum. We were ready, we're doing largely ubiquity. We're familiar with the ecosystem. And LTU basically ate them for lunch for us is what happened. I mean, we all of a sudden we had the APs, but we weren't familiar with them. We we're very familiar with ubiquity. LTU all of a sudden started kicking butt. We had some 45 megahertz clean spectrum and we just started deploying LTU like crazy in all the places that we had planned to do uh radwin and honestly it's why we don't have more radwin than we do where we have it deployed it's very niche what we're do we're using it for non line of sight near line of sight in high noise um situations short range uh because they do at the time they were really the only player that was doing really good um beam forming i mean you could go to 450m but it was a lot more money um and they work really well in that scenario. Where I go to church is, uh, you know, it's only about a mile and a half from our pop, but it's going through three trees and four buildings. And, you know, we, we've got our church hooked up to it. And I run sound and audio there. And, you know, we get 150 by 150 there all the time through trees when it's raining. That's short distance, but yeah. that's something that Air Max wasn't doing, not having beam forming. Right. And so are those duos the uh, integrated version or are they the connectorized version? So they are the, the Neo Duo, which is integrated. So they have connectorized um, subscriber units, um, which yeah. we've uh, coupled with like the, the starter dish or the, or the ultra dish. But um, for the most part, like what we have there at church is just the integrated um, um, mod. Gotcha. Yeah. But yeah. We have, well, I think a dozen of their Neo Duos out. So just, I don't have a ton of data. It was LTU it took over where we had intended for, for Radwin to, to take over. Yeah, sure. But the point to multipoint, then we got Donna on two APs, and now we're doing um, a bunch of 60 gigahertz with the, with the new Wave stuff from Ubiquity. Really impressed with that. <laughs> it's not perfect. We live in a major thunderstorm zone. I was really concerned about rain fade. But that AX chipset that they're using in it with auto 5 gig failover um, has been impressive. I mean, short range, mile and a half and under, but 150 by 150 on a 20 megahertz channel for backup, I'm not complaining about that. I mean, it, it works well. So we're deploying you know, up to 450 by 450. Honestly, if we go to the, the full channel width, we can push gig by gig. We just... We just aren't, so we can scale a little better. Honestly, nobody needs gig anyway. Um, but you know, we're doing we're doing four. What? what was that? I'm sorry, I didn't hear you say it again. <laughs> and our customers, you know, our business customers that we've predominantly been hooking up to it are really happy with it. It's impressive. We're yeah. switching them from cable over to that, and they love it. Yeah, I mean, and it goes to show, right? As long as the connection is stable uh, and reliable they really don't notice that they have 150 meg versus 400 meg, right? For for the most part, of course, if they're heavy users, businesses, I understand. Right. I mean, you, you definitely have a lot of traffic going on. Uh, and again, it depends on the type of business, but that's, that's, that's cool. I really like, I really like the uh, 60 gig product from, from Ubiquity. I mean, it's, I've, I've really yet to hear anything negative about it. You know, I mean, it just seems like it just, it just works. I know Microtech for the longest time was kind of the king of 60 gig, you know, I mean, they kind of hit the market first and really dedicated a lot of time uh, into the hardware development for that stuff. But it seems like Ubiquity is really kicking ass right there. That's awesome. Yeah, we've been impressed. I mean, it's not been perfect. They've had some bugs and obviously, you know, the firmware that we're running right now is still beta, you know, and so... We've kind of let our customers know that it's beta, but you know, yeah. we're, 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 we're slow to deploy something. We tested Toronto for six months before we deployed it. Um, we had a little higher comfort zone with Ubiquity because we have so much of it out there. We tested it to death, set it up at our office, and um, you know, I, I feel like it's, it's ready to go at, at, at this point with the, the beta 5, beta 7 that's been really stable for us. Awesome. 
Very cool. Very cool. What about your, your Toronto testing? What do you see in there? You know, we've been critical, uh, you know, in the early part, just because I think so many people were running on pure hopium, right? As, right. Which is what right. we, you know, we see this as, you know, when something new comes out and everyone's like, well, this is going to be the, the, the next big thing. Right. And those of us yeah. that have been yeah. around a lot, we're like, well, maybe one day, but there's a lot of pain between point A and point B. So, you know, what's your, your experience been so far? Yeah, I mean, there is no magical unicorn. Physics are physics. Um, you're not going to defy those. Um, you know, I think we had to temper our expectations a little bit. Um, and at this point, you know, we call it a tool in the shed. It is not um, the end-all, be-all. If we had to exist on Strictly Toronto, we would cease to exist, at least at the capacity that we do right now. Uh, simply because we wouldn't have the cash flow to hook up 100 subs a month on Toronto. We we simply couldn't do it. Um, but to have it as a tool in the shed, to deploy it to, you know, right now, by the end of the summer, we expect to have Toronto on our seven busiest towers with 10 gig backhaul. Um, to have it, we're, we're kind of doing five gig only be, just because I... I haven't been very cracked up with all the CBRS outages that they, I just, I don't know how I would explain that one to my customers. I haven't thought of a good way, <laughs> a good way to do that yet. So five gig it is. Um, we're kind of going to offer two plans, what we're calling blast light. That's up to a hundred meg that might go through some trees. It might be real long distances or just somebody who doesn't want to pay more. And then we're doing what we call blast, which we're going to say it's, Somewhere between 100 and 400, up to 400 down, and somewhere between 50 and 100 up. Um, and we're going to keep it very simple, those two plans. Hmm. We're going to overlay it with our RFE and and uh, and Ubiquity. We're still going to hook up as many subs as we can to Ubiquity at $350 to hook up a Ubiquity sub, you know, with truck roll and time and labor and everything versus 1500 with the Piranha. We're still gonna we're still gonna use that to feed our Toronto addiction, I guess you might say. But <laughs> hey, if we can start doing ten percent of our total installs per month, you know, ten per month out of the hundred in Toronto, those are higher revenue per subscriber customers. They're yep. now you. Um, they're for the people that want it, the people that say we're not for real. Hey, guess what? We are for real. We can you know, if for real in your mind means four hundred meg, we can do that in the right conditions. Um, if for business customers, what have you not. And even for, um, with bead coming up here and in the state of Pennsylvania, we've got capital projects fund coming up here, which is 200 million that the state broadband authority is rolling out. Um, I'm pretty good friends with those guys and we're, we're being pretty loud about the fact that, um, by, by the time that grant is on its feet. We're going to have 400 by 100 via fixed wireless to 50% of our customer base that want it. And you better not come over build us on that because it's being funded for us anyway, not all of it. Our seven towers that I'm talking about right now are organic out of pocket. We've got 10 more that are coming that are funded by the NTIA. So why would you take federal money and put me out of business because I'm fixed <laughs> wireless? It's 400 by 100. I've got the yeah. numbers on the plans that my customers are on. I can tell you um, the extra 100 meg, 200 meg, 300 meg doesn't have a big pull in my market. It just makes no sense. Um, yeah. So anyways, all that to say this, it's a tool in the shed. You've got 60 gigahertz. You've got 5 gig ubiquity. You've got Tirana. Uh, we're, honestly, we're doing some fiber grants right now. We're working on that. We're going to do everything we can to adapt and and be able to be nimble on our feet for whatever comes down the road at us. Yeah, that's that that's really smart. And really that's that's what it's all about, right? I mean, you know, my biggest pet peeve, you know, with the unicorns out there is everybody thinks that they're gonna get the maximum that's in the spec sheet all the time, right? Like with CBRS, you know, my problem is a lot of people are playing with, you know, the GA, right? Oh, yeah. And that's that that spectrum is not going to be there all the time. You may right. get 40 megahertz or 80 yeah. megahertz of it. Who knows? Right. Right. But it's not guaranteed. And it's really about for me, 
you know, my caution that I'm putting out there is not about the platform, right? It's it's about how you use it, right? right. And right. you start offering a gig because if you get, if you have a full-size PAL and you're using a full-size GAA and you're offering a gig, well, if part of that goes away, the GAA, now you can't, you can't uh, deliver that. That's, that's a problem, right? So you being conservative, but yet still exceeding, you know, what's required is, is really the smart thing to do. And that's, that's awesome to see it because I mean, the, the there's almost no denying the magic that Tirana does. I mean, oh, it goes wow. places, yeah. it goes places, no other radio will go hands down, there's no denying that stuff, right. right? You know, the back end stuff, you know, the, the issues they're having with SaaS may not be them. It's probably the SaaS people, yeah. software bugs, all the little nuances and and tricks you have to do to get it to work is a whole other story. But yeah, I mean, the, the platform itself is, I mean, that's what you get when you have a $15,000 AP. I mean, it right. does right. some really cool shit. <laughs> so it is a yeah. Gen 1 product. People do. Yeah, you know, exactly. Yeah. You know, it's a Gen 1 product. And so, um, you know, kudos to them. I actually just had lunch with the Toronto sales guy yesterday, and you know, they're they um they're listening. You know, they're 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 making changes. They're good. They're introducing things that this community has asked for. And to be perfect, that's awesome. Honest, um, you don't hear about it much, but you've got phone companies, Frontiers, Windstreams, cable companies, Spectrum that are deploying Tirana. They're they're being very quiet we about it, but that's that's new in this space. No one, you know, I don't know that there's, I shouldn't say no one. There's probably some uh, some cable companies out there that maybe they've deployed 450M or something, but um, it, they have succeeded in getting the attention of some of the big guys as well. Uh, well, that's their focus, I think, too. Yeah. I mean, so. Yeah. Right? It's, it's those deep pockets and uh, as another, you know, another part of my concern there is, when these deep pocket customers like Spectrum start firing up all these APs and all these different areas, that's when that GA is just going to start shrinking. Exactly. It's just going to start shrinking, and you're going to have problems. So now, I, I really like I really like your approach across the board. I mean, even 60 gigahertz, right? You're still not running full channels there. That's smart, you know. It's right. just I can go more range, better rain fade, and uh, you know. You you got it. There's a reason why you're doing well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hey, you know, in this space. I'm telling you, I can't tell you how many times I've reached out to other operators. I've gone, visited their facilities. I've called them, Facebook messaged them. Um, everybody's just willing to help and share. And, you know, even a podcast like this where, you know, in some spaces, the things I'm talking about would be viewed as trade secrets. For me, I'm just trying to help other operators out there because they've helped me. Yeah, I mean, that really plays into the, the community side of things, you know. Um, and in the beginning, you know, a, a long time ago, it really wasn't like that. Everyone wanted to, to play their secrets really close to the pocket and not really share any information. Yeah. But I think when, you know, over the years, the the industry realized, hey, it's not me versus you. It's us versus the big players or Them. us versus right. the government or us versus whatever. So it kind of behooves you to, to figure out how to run better um, you know, just do better. And then when everyone does better, the industry as a whole does better. And it, it just goes a lot further when we're, you know, in front of Washington or, or something like that, for sure. So, right. right. We faced a lot of that in the beginning too, when the horns came out. I mean, the operators, everybody was skeptical to use our product because it just didn't make sense at the time. And for those who actually, you know, tried it behind the scenes, they're like, wow, this, this is like magic at that time. Right. It was that version of magic for them, you know, and exactly. they wouldn't tell anybody they wanted to keep it for themselves. You know, it's just like, but we're like, no, but just, just think about how much better it's going to be when your competitor is making less noise too. And it, exactly. it took, yeah. it took some time to kind of figure this out and say, Hey, let's, let's, let's make this all work together. And, and we started looking like a, a much bigger community than, than, than it was, you know, not too long ago, it was right. really dog eat dog, you know, right. but right. But 2019, they might, we must have all figured it out because I can't tell you how many people told me at that show, radio show that yeah, you need yeah. to talk to RF Elements because, you know, you know, it, 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 it literally changed our minds. At that point, we had we had uh, a sad experience trying to acquire another small wisp in our area. They backed out on day of closing and ended up selling it to an employee. We already uh, borrowed the money from the bank and everything else. Yeah. So we went to American Town. We said, "Hey, we've got these three towers. Can we get on them?" Got approval from the bank, and uh, 
this was all prior to this trade show and we had already ordered most of our materials we ended up uh, canceling six 60 degree ubiquity sectors in that project and doing six horns out of the three towers and uh, those horns are still up today they were 60 degree asymmetrical it felt like at the time it was all we could afford but today they're all horns i mean 60 some towers worth of horns and we've never looked back i mean it's been fantastic awesome Rick, yeah, for real, for real. So, <laughs> uh, and I guess sort of tail ending the sort of, I don't know, tech and RF side of the conversation here. So are you using any six gig stuff or doing any testing there? Or are you just kind of letting, letting everyone else figure that out first? Yeah. I mean, so we have the five nine STA, which technically isn't, isn't six gig, but no, we, we haven't. Um, I felt like, you know, they were pretty specific about the fact that you're not supposed to be making money on that. And, um, mm-hmm. That's why I'm in business. So um, I've opted. Uh, I've opted not to go that route. I didn't feel like I wanted to hook up a bunch of customers to a product that we ultimately don't know the final guidelines yet. You know, for you know GPS receivers on the customer premise unit, so that you can go full EIRP. And you know, in, in my space here um, with the terrain. 911 has a you know EMS has a ton of towers and they're all six gig backhaul and so yep. I don't know what's going to happen there. So for me it was like I you know every nickel I've got right now I'm putting into the likes of of Tirana and and 60 gigahertz and and more expansion. Um, there'll be enough time at some point down the road. We've got enough of towers. We're four years into the cycle. We're constantly going back and touching towers. Um, we'll have some towers somewhere that once we know what six gig is, that we can go back and upgrade them. And, you know, I don't, I don't see that being a problem. I'm excited about it, no doubt, but we it feels like we've been waiting on that unicorn for <laughs> a long time and we still don't have it. Yeah. Yeah. It definitely has the potential to be yeah, another, another unicorn for sure. Yeah. You know, and, and there's just so many unknowns with the AFC as well. And, you know, we've already, or at least I've personally been, you know, getting feedback from some of the testers out there that the FCC has been snooping around a lot of these installs because there are complaints coming in from the uh, incumbents, right, who are running, right. right? So the FCC is dealing, going out there and trying to find these sources of noise, right? Uh, and, you know, what's that going to be like when, you're, when your customers are on there, you know, and they, they got to shut you down and you're down for a week or even a day. I mean, it's... um. You know, the, the the spectrum is nice, you know, but, uh, you know, I mean, it's like five gig is just still there and still, a you know, uh, a usable thing if you use it smart, you right. know, so right. we'll, we'll see. I mean, I, I hope it happens soon. Oh, me too. Uh, I'm, I can't but, wait. Yeah. But I, like I said, you know, a lot of people are already talking about, you know, running 160 meg channels everywhere. You know, I'm just like, oh, you know, and you're not going to have much six gig left if you do that. Right. Uh, you know, but they're the ones that are, you know, basically wanting to push that one gig narrative to everybody, you know, so, but we'll see, we'll see how it, how it turns out. I mean, uh, like I said, we, I have hope for the hardware. Cambium is really, you know, working hard right now to try and get that stuff going. I know Mimosa has some new radios coming as well. I heard somewhere, you know, new CPE and stuff like that. So, so ho- hopefully by Wispapalooza, we hear some new news from people about that stuff, you know, including ourselves. Right. Right. And I, honestly, I, I, I know that the hardware manufacturers know more than we do, or I would like to think that they do. (laughs) But I think for them, let's just talk about Ubiquity for a second. I think the reason we haven't seen anything from them is they're waiting on the same thing we are. You know, they want to be cost effective. They can't afford to invest money in releasing a product that the final revision might be different based on FCC rules. So that I think, I think we'll see something from Ubiquity, but I think we're not going to see it until we know 100% what the rules are. Yep. And it's affecting, you know, Tirana and Cambium and everyone else as well as they, you know, they are waiting on the FCC as well. Yeah. And, you know, Wi-Fi 7 is right around the corner too, right? So, I mean, it's just like... 6G. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. 6G. Uh, or as Nathan says on his LinkedIn... Uh, inventor of 9g or something like that you know? <laughs> whatever was the 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 eight minute ab joke or something like that. i forget what movie it was you yeah know? yeah yeah but um okay 
so then you know to to feed all these tower sites you know you've got 60 some odd sites like i know you use a lot of 80 gig right so i mean are you primarily 80 gig backhaul on a lot of this are you able to get fiber to a lot of these towers or what does that look like for you yeah so you know i keep dropping names of you know things that have been game changing for us um and one of the things that have been game changing for us have, have been albeit um Ken and Ben and and uh, mm -hmm. the team there, from their support to their products, the whole nine yards. Um, so we have, hmm, I, I I can't even tell you for sure. Twenty, twenty two, twenty three, albeit links, um, and they range from two point oh, you know, eleven gig, eighteen gig links with one point four gigs of bandwidth, all the way to multi band um, with eleven eighty, eighteen eighty. Um, and we, have, and we do have some 80 gig, straight 80 gig. Um, we don't have many of those for just the very simple reason we get too many thunderstorms. Um, mm. so the straight 80, if I need a 10 gig circuit in the first place, then backing it up with a five gig link probably isn't good enough. <laughs> um, so I can't really, you know, we have two that we have out that are that are straight 80 otherwise they're multi-band you know with at least 740 or 1.4 gigs backing up to 10 gigs um but we have um just looking at my numbers list here i think we have 15 fiber circuits um so we've got three upstreams that are one core two upstreams that are other core We're working on connecting our two cores right now um and that, so that's five of those so we've got what 10 12 sites that are um just basically fiber point to points from towers where they're too far away to do e-band um and so we've got no choice but doing but doing you know paying for whoever the the cable company the telcos got fiber at that site for the cell guys we're buying you know point to points from them for the bandwidth basically what we like to do is about every five to seven towers have a fiber circuit even if it's just there for backup and our primary is wireless um because we've got more capacity you know a 1.4 gig obvious link versus a one gig fiber circuit um but you know every four or five towers we like to throw a fiber circuit in the mix for for redundancy you know we built full rings everywhere as much as pop doing uh licensed backhauls and and fiber we do have a few unlicensed here and there we've got a lot of silos and grain legs they're down low they're not mountaintop sites i can get out of the noise you know we'll do some unlicensed but honestly it's been obvious and af11s we've got probably another 20 plus links that are af11 they they're nothing special they're cheap they're 650 megs of bandwidth all day every day yeah. uh, they're no noise they work really well uh they integrate with you know everything else ubiquity um so that that's what we do for for bandwidth for the most part we've got a big project all these towers that we're upgrading to tirana we're going back through we're going to be putting a bunch more multi-band links up with uh you know now the obby can do dual channel on the microwave with 1.4 on the backup and still 10 on the 80, you know, if we lose the 80, at least we've got a gig and a half for the duration of that thunderstorm. So we're going to be putting a bunch more of those up as well, where, you know, where they're close enough, where we can, where we can actually do that with E-Band. One of the things actually I should say too is uh, this, so people are talking about fiber and doing fiber and we're looking at it as well. We're running the numbers on this, the ROI, six passings per mile. It just doesn't make sense. <laughs> but um, everywhere that we're, we're doing fiber, it's all about integrating into our WISP network. We're bringing as many towers into that fiber fold as possible so that we can backhaul our own towers with our own mm -hmm. fiber. Because honestly, one of our biggest monthly recurring costs are those point-to-point -point fiber circuits. Mm. They're just a drain. And so, you know, if I could cut those out with my own fiber, back them up with my own wireless backhauls, it's a win-win for us. Yeah, 100%. And that's what you see, you know, a lot of people start, you know, getting their feet wet in the fiber thing. You know, realizing, learning what it takes to get it done, realizing that it's not necessarily rocket science, but it's like anything else. Like, there's definitely a learning curve, but... 
Yeah. You know, once you can, out. as much as your own infrastructure you've got control over and knowledge of, you know, you know, no telling where your point to point actually runs through, right? You may be going A to B, but there's a loop that it gets through to get to here. So the more where you can control and go, oh, I know there's construction coming down this road, so they're probably going to dig it up, right? So you can you hey, can plan that, ahead and do that sort of stuff. Just, you know, you're you're building your own fate at that point, which I think is really important. Right, right. Yeah. How, how many subs do you guys have? We are 2,100 and wow. wow. as of end of the month here. So That is since 2019, huh? Yeah, so... Interesting. I mean, I mentioned that I'm a numbers guy. I'll, I'll just cover some of those numbers. So August 2019, we hooked up our first customer. Um, August 2020, we had 250 customers. So the first Good. year, we built out to four towers, the three American Tower sites, and then that one uh, TV tower that we were on. 250 customers, four towers after the first year. So from August 2020 till August 2023, which we're not quite there yet. Um, you know, basically in the in those three years, by you know, by August, if we continue the trend by August twenty twenty three, you know, we'll we'll be at twenty five hundred subs. Um, we're gonna be at sixty five or more towers. Wow. Three years time we went from four towers to sixty one, you know, macro towers. We've got another hundred plus repeater sites over and above the the macro sites. Um so like in the last year, last 12 months, we hooked up 800, 873 subs in the last 12 months. So we have yeah. yet to crack that thousand sub year. That's our goal mm -hmm. right now is to get to that, that thousand subs a year. But that puts us at an average of 73 new customers um, per month over the last 12 months. And That's exciting, man. That is so so, so no taco truck for you guys anytime in the near future then, right? I mean, unless it's to motivate the guys to work weekends. Then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's exciting. I love it, man. Good for you. Good yeah. for you. It, it, we have a great team. There's no doubt about it. You know, we've got a community that stands behind us. You know, really of those, let me just look at this. Past ISPs here, so we 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 track this. I mean, we've got forty seven percent of our customers come from DSL, um, twenty five percent come from cable, which the cable company in this area is offering. There's two: one offers gig, the other offers one point two gig. So a full twenty five percent are coming from cable, um, about four percent from satellite, three percent from other WISP, six percent from five G, four G, cellular, and a whopping fifteen percent that simply didn't have internet because there was no good ISP to get. So I find it interesting that, you know, despite being rural, 25% of our customers come from the cable company because they hate the cable company. Prices are going up all the time. They're oversubscribed. Yeah. All those things. It's a timing game for them. And all these low prices are just to pressure everybody out of the market. And then they're going to just raise their prices and rape everybody. Exactly. I mean, yeah. you know, so it's like just... You know, keep keep up the good work over there, man. I was having this conversation with another wisp this week, and it's like, you know, thirty bucks for a gig. Yeah, you know, I don't really care because they've got all I need is about ten percent of those cable customers to be unhappy and switch to me, and they still fund my rural development where I've got six passings per mile. So if I can get ten percent of cables customers, that's all I need. I don't need seventy percent market penetration where there's cable. And there's always going to be the 10% of people whose bill has gone up every six months for the last five years, and they're just sick of dealing with it. So yep. if we offer a good competitive service that, you know, even if it's only 150 meg, which is the top plan we've offered up until this year, that hasn't seemed to be a major factor for the people switching from cable. Uh, and I'm sure since you're a numbers guy, you probably know this offhand too, but you know, how, what's your average like bandwidth usage per customer in general, or maybe split between, you know, business and residential, if you've got a heavy mix, but you know, how much bandwidth are people really consuming versus, you know, what they think they need? This is a conversation we've had with other operators and it's always interesting. Yeah. And I think our, our, um, where we're at is very close to like the, the report that Precine puts out on the average. We're very close to that. We've got two cores, um, and, you know, looking at pre-scene, when you combine that, 
we're pushing six to eight gigs at peak time. So over 2000 customers. Um, actually, our business customers use significantly less than our residential customers, and they're using it during the day when residential customers aren't. So we love business customers. Um, but, you know, more interesting for, interestingly for us is the fact that our 10 meg customers don't use any less data per month than our 150 meg customers. Uh, exactly. That's an interesting stat to us is the fact that the people that think they need that 150 meg plan, when you, you know, we monitor how much they use per month. We've got people on 12 meg plans or 25 meg plans that are using three, four terabyte a month. Um, and I would say that, you know, of our top five to 10% of heaviest users are all in that 25 to 30 meg plan range, not the 150 meg. Um, so yeah, I would say peak time, it's five to 10 meg tops, you mm -hmm. know, yep. between subscribers, which falls right into, right into that average. Yeah. The pre number was seven, I think. Yeah. Right. So yep. yeah. Exactly. Yeah, we use Preseam. That that's another one that's been a game changer for us. I think we got Preseam right around 250 subs, and um, I wouldn't even begin to want to run my network without it. I, I posted about it. We saw the other day. We've got we were out in that little town of Roaring Spring hooking up <clears throat> customers. We were getting 400 meg from the cable company on a speed test, but Netflix sat on their TV buffering, and uh, we switched them over to our connection. Uh, the TV was hardwired in both cases, hardwired into our 60 meg connection, and Netflix went to 4K right off the bat. So even though they were getting a 400 meg speed test from the cable company, Netflix was buffering. And, you know, some of that is QOE. There's no doubt about it. And yep. you know, hats off to, to pre-seam for that. But even just like our CSR people love it as well somebody calls in and they're complaining about internet being slow or something it's like well yeah you've had your connection pegged for the last two weeks you know you really need to be on that next higher plan so you know over and above being a network tool to keep our network clean it's become a sales tool for us as well so we like pre seem a lot latency is king yeah for sure for sure but yeah even on that subject like uh, percentage wise, like I like I said, I'm a numbers guy. We got 20% of our customers are on 10 to 15 meg plans. We've got 42% of our customers that are on the 25 to 30 meg plan. 30% of our customers are on a 50 to 75 meg, and 10% of our customers are 100 meg and up. Uh, so we find that 25 to 30 meg being sufficient for about half of our customers, and you know we get. Very few complaints. We've got 828 five star reviews on on you know, Google and Facebook combined, and yeah, you, know, you just you don't do that in today's world where everybody's bash happy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That if you have a bad network, there's just there's just no two way <clears throat> two ways about it. Exactly, and they're always super vocal to take it out on the old Google. You know, that just seems oh, to yeah. be the the main thing. So it's always funny, like looking at ISP. You know, not just with but ISP, you know, reviews in general. And it's, you know, yeah. some of them are just absolutely dumpster fires. But then, you know, someone like you or you know, some of these others that we, we deal with on a regular basis are pulling, you know, five or four, eight or something like that. You know, right. you're doing a good job right. for sure. So now people love to hate their ISP. There's no doubt about it. And we're not perfect. <laughs> we've gotten some one star reviews, but we've reached out to those people. We've made it right. And, you know, I don't know, it's may have been maybe eight or 10 or so that we've had, um, you know, actually go back and change their review based on the fact that we followed up and, you know, made things right. So um, customer service for us really has been what has set us apart, not offering gigabit, but customer service has been, been the key. Yeah, that's definitely something we've, we've gotten so much feedback and we hammer onto it a lot too, is, you know, being a, a real player in your community and, you know, have someone that, you know, the little things like answers the phone and actually does tech support, you know, yeah, just those little yeah. minor things. But, um, no, I mean, that's really what's driving it versus the flashiness and, you know, pump, you know, pimped out vans and everything else like that for sure. So next sort of question wise is, you know, you're, you're in this sort of tremendous growth phase. I mean, what are your biggest challenges in terms of either, 
you know, network infrastructure growth or client growth. I mean, I'm sure manpower is definitely got to play into it. You know, that's always an issue that people have. But, you know, what, what are you seeing are the, the hardest things to overcome or the hardest things to overcome, you know, to kind of hit where your goals are? Yeah, interestingly enough, we're very fortunate with manpower. We've got an excellent team. You know, 2019, there was two employees and myself, and those two, honestly, they spent all their time on the IT side. We kind of brought broadband in as a as an experiment, really. And you know, today we're we're 10 employees. Um, you know, so we you know we've added all those employees since 2019. The biggest challenge for us has just been shortages of things vehicles being one of them mm. we use ford transits and f-150s for our installer vehicles and like transits yeah it's been 18 months to 20 months since you've been able to get a transit you know you just we have more guys than we have vehicles so we started getting f-150s because we couldn't get transits well the aluminum cappers to go on the back of them so you can put ladders on them have a 28 week lead time. I mean, aluminum is 20 weeks out. So um, that has been one of the reasons we don't have more subs than we do right now is the fact that we have not had vehicles to put guys in to go out and hook them up. So that one has been, that one I think has kept us from hitting 2,000 subs last year. That was our goal and we didn't get it and we couldn't, couldn't get vehicles. It was so frustrating. But, um, and other supply supply chain issues have been a problem as well. We were, we're very fortunate. We have a big warehouse. And when COVID first hit, I immediately went to my bank. I said, what's the largest line of credit I can possibly <laughs> take <laughs> out? I think we got like a quarter million dollar line of credit. And we went out and we maxed it out immediately before this, the you know supply chain crises really hit. And all throughout COVID, we deployed to 60-some towers, pulling mostly from materials that we bought in one lump sum before the supply crisis hit. But, you know, just from a cash flow perspective, needing to keep three months to six months worth of install inventory in stock, because you never know when it's going to go out of stock. Mm -hmm. And right now, when demand is high, it costs me, we've pushed the pencil like crazy, it costs me more money not to be able to hook up customers because I don't have the material, then it costs me to pay four or five, even 6% of interest on line of credit uh, so that I can keep six months worth of supplies in my warehouse and not run out. So um, it's really been supply chain has been our number one thing holding us, holding us back. And I would say after that, it's probably just cash flow, like, you know, growing pains going from four towers to 60 towers and the tower rents for 60 towers hitting you only hook up so many customers per month and you need customers for that monthly reoccurring revenue to increase. And so for us, it was like, bam, we had 60 tower hit rent wise almost all at once. And we didn't have enough customers. We actually were going backwards for a little while. And uh, so that, you know, managing that cash flow plus needing to keep that much inventory um, was a big challenge for us as well. So I would say those have been those have been the big ones. And even now, cash flow, like for Toronto, we'd love to go out. A $12,000 AP is a $12,000 AP, okay? It's not the end of the world, but a $1,000 customer premise unit, when you're hooking up 100 a month, mm -hmm. that's a big deal. That takes a lot of cash to make that happen. And so I would say, you know, cash flow would be the other big one for us is just balancing all that and knowing that we need to grow and expand and stay on the edge so we don't have somebody be attracted to our area because they see there's a big need there that's not being filled. You know, hmm. that's basically where we're at there. Yeah, that's really interesting. And I think that the the cash flow side of things like, you know, especially for small businesses, you know, a lot of people focused on direct profitability, which is important, obviously. ROI, super important um in managing that. But I think a lot of people just sort of neglect as to what the actual cash flow just reoccurring is that where it comes up. So, you know, it's, it's super cool. Hey, I can, I can wait two years to make the money back on this, whatever they're doing. Right. But during that gap, you know, you've got, I don't know, employees to feed. Yeah. Like keep lights on, you know, things like that. And I think there's a lot of that sort of thing that gets uh, neglected either. You just, you know, just out of ignorance or just, you know, just not knowing. So. Right. It's, right. You know, cash flow kill a business real quick. So. It's Absolutely. Definitely something to stay hold of. So 
I was just saying hooking up 100 customers a month sounds great until you do the math and you realize what cash flow it takes to do that. I mean, it's it's uh, it's not insignificant. And, you know, I would say our inexperience with needing to front that much capital every month to hook up the new customers has been it's been a learning curve for us. In the IT MSP space, you don't you don't really have that. It's a it's a break fix. It's a project. You're collecting 50 percent down before you deploy. Yeah all that kind of stuff. So it's been a whole new dynamic for us that my inexperience really was um, why we ended up in as tight of a situation as we did. I'd say we're in a good spot today, but I've certainly I've learned a lot. Um, it's maybe one of the things that, you know, at the uh, WISPA shows, WISPA Blues or whatnot, it's one of the things they're always asking, what are things to put on the agenda and, and whatnot? And I think maybe that would be a good one from my point of view that I'd be interested in is more from a business standpoint, good business practices, managing cash flow. So you want to, so you want to do 150 or 250 installs a month. How do you practically go about doing that, leveraging that, you know, loan programs, grant programs, you know, honestly, that has been another key to our success has been our community relationships with our counties, our county commissioners, and we've leveraged CARES Act and ARPA grant dollars that helped us build out to these 60 towers in the time frame that we did um so there's been that whole side of it that you know some people hate it and they think big brother <laughs> own, owns us now um i look at it the other way i look at it as a business opportunity i'm serving six passings per mile in an area that probably no one else is ever going to look at and these people it's game changing for them and if i wouldn't have stepped up and taking that money and done a whole lot more with it than anybody else was able to do with it, who knows where it would have gone, and it wouldn't have been connecting our rural communities to high speed internet. Yeah, it's it's keeping the money in the community, and you know, versus going to some you know nameless mega corp or something like that, because the money is going to go somewhere. So whatever your feelings exactly. are about government spending and everything else, like if the money's earmarked, like it's going to go somewhere. So it makes sense to yeah, and it's their yeah. money. So yeah. it's going yep. to get spent. So it makes sense to to spend it somewhere where, you know, local business stay in the community and that sort of thing means so much. So, and, and there's a lot of people too that are, I mean, they get hung up with stuff like even just, you know, reasonable use of credit, you know, everything's got to be, you know, we're just going to pay for it with cash and everything else. And then what happens is, is you end up just completely, you know, gimping yourself because you don't have that cash and, you know, now instead yep. of building and expanding the business, you're in a position where you're just waiting for this organic money to come up, which is great, but you could be building it so much faster with, you know, smart uses of capital where it makes sense. Right. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Unless you, do you have any other sort of like main areas or topics and stuff like this has been great. This has been a super useful conversation. Are there any other main areas or topics that you want to hit up, Dwayne? Um, yeah, I mean, I would, I would, um, I just want to give a shout out. Yeah, you know, I, I've been mentioning, you know, a few things that were game changing for us along the way. Obviously, we talked about our elements, talked about pre seam, talked about the community, wish talk, like it or hate it, whatever. Just be smart on how you, how you interact there. But it, it's great. There's a lot to be gleaned there. The trade shows have been fantastic for us. Um, but there's, there's been, there's been a few, there's been a few other ones. Um, you know, I a lot of people know that I'm not necessarily a big Cambium fan. I love what Cambium does for the community. They're a great vendor. Um, they haven't necessarily worked out for us. Um, but CN Heat from Cambium has single-handedly changed the way that we do business um, from a pre-qualifications standpoint for installs from a no-go. We switched to CN Heat six, eight months ago, whatever it's been. And we went from about a 30 to 40% no-go ratio to where we didn't do pre-qualification. So we used Google Earth. We used whatever other tools were out there. And we'd say, hey, it looks like a go, but ultimately we can't tell. We'd roll a truck, we'd get out there, and there was trees in the way or whatever, and we couldn't couldn't connect. About 30%. So then that time was wasted because you couldn't necessarily fill that time slot with another install because you didn't have one on the schedule. You had to wait till the next schedule install. And so it, it was expensive for us. It was inefficient. Um, we switched to CN heat and I think our no go rate since we switched to CN heat is like, it's ridiculously low under 3%. Wow. Um, 
Oh. So, you know, we're going out there. Every installer is getting their three installs a day, almost every day. Um, wow. You know, and so that has been that has been huge. We've been able to process, we've been able to advertise a lot more um, and bring more leads in in general because we're able to weed out the bad ones. Uh, so that actually caught us flat footed. We had to ramp up our advertising <laughs> because suddenly we were going through leads that much faster because our qualification process was better. So, you know, people were like, oh man, it's that much expensive. It's per tower per month. Listen, guys, it saves you a ton of cash per month. It doesn't cost you. So, and Seth and his guys there on that CN Heat team, I mean, I'll send an email and I'll get a response in 30 seconds or five minutes. I mean, it's, they've just been crazy. They've been fantastic to work with. So in the last six, eight months, that has been the single biggest game changer in, in, in ramping up our number of installs and being efficient. Um, I can't imagine going back to being without that. Uh, a couple other ones, you know, like it or hate it, UISP has been is free. <laughs> it's been a very powerful tool for us. For me, being running a lean team to have that much power in my palm on a mobile app, see being able to see that much of my network has been huge. Um, so we we use them a lot. We like that. There's been some vendors I I knew networking, but not networking as an ISP. Like IP Architects has come in and basically took us to a fully redundant ring the network you know with mpls and ospf and all those things just a game changer i go to bed at night and i know if i lose a link who cares you know the backup link <laughs> is going to pick it up and, you know i can deal with it tomorrow you know and so um you know going to bed sleeping easy at night switching from you know edge routers to microtik and juniper for routers you know in the evolution of our business that that has been huge um and i'd say lastly for me has been the reviews, so I, I mentioned the reviews. Some people hate them. Some people like them. For us, one of the things that we've done, so it's hard to keep installers motivated. There's only so much that's exciting about going out every day and putting dishes on people's roofs. And we offer a $50 bonus for every five-star review. And we tell our installers, Go after the customer for that review. Ask them for it. Tell a customer that you get a kickback if you get a review. Um, it motivates our installers. It makes us look good. So we get the reviews. And then what that has done is when we go to advertise, billboards, Facebook, whatever, people see us. They've never heard of us. They Google us. They see, you know, 800 five-star reviews. They're like, an internet service provider with that many five-star reviews? I want to do this. They <laughs> forget about the price. They forget about... The speed, yep. it's just, we, we're just coming for that customer service experience. And so I would say if you aren't pursuing getting a positive social media presence, you should be, because if you want to grow, use that in conjunction with your advertising. It'll make your advertising that much more effective because people do see the reviews and they do care about it. So I think that's kind of been... Um, you know, for us, as we've grown, we've needed to advertise and our advertising has become that much more effective because of those reviews. So I think that pretty much sums it up. You know, I was just trying to think about ways of, you know, let's make this call useful, beneficial to others. And those have been some of the tips that have really, they've really been game changing for us in the last couple of years. That's awesome. So much great information in this episode, man. Thanks for sharing all of that. Yeah, my, my pleasure. It's great. Yeah, just incredibly useful. So, Dwayne, if anyone's looking to find you, um, you know, or to reach out, you know, uh, of course, you're on, you know, West Talk a lot. I think that's where a lot of folks out there know you from. Um, but, you know, anywhere else where if anyone's looking for you, where they can reach out? Yeah, sure. I mean, so you can Google us. You know, we're on social media. So Facebook, Google, um, our website is out there. You know, if you email us from the website, I still kind of, watch that mailbox even though i'm not the guy who responds to it but you know facebook messenger i don't have facebook friends i don't have a personal facebook profile really but i, I have a facebook account so i can you know follow the the uh, industry related pages and i do use facebook messenger some um but yeah google search will, will pretty much get us i'm on linkedin as well um you know be a uh, yeah, fairly fairly well connected on there so you can reach out there if you want if you need to find me there you know you can you can connect up. We use Telegram for uh, internal messaging, so if you've got a Telegram account, probably uh, hit you up there because that's uh, our preferred communications platform as a company. 
Very cool, very cool. Tasa, is anyone looking to find us? Where can they do this? So? Yeah, you could definitely find us all over on social media as well. You can find us uh, at uh, our RF Elements page on Facebook, uh, any of the industry uh, groups like Wisp Talk and the like, uh, LinkedIn, and of course, our website, rfelements.com, or just email me, tasos at rfelements.com, caleb at rfelements.com. We're everywhere all the time. <laughs> <laughs> All right, everyone. So until we talk to you guys next time, we'll be talking to you later. Bye. Thanks, guys. Bye.